In the previous video in the series, we looked at how microcontrollers interfaced with the outside world using their I.O. ports. And while that is arguably the most important feature on a microcontroller, along with the CPU itself, there are still a lot of features that make working with these microcontrollers a lot easier. Take, for instance, the standard blinking LED example that everyone is familiar with. You simply delay the CPU in order to flash an LED at a specified interval. But what if you wanted to do other things at the same time? Well, that's where hardware timers come in. They can keep track of time for you, while the CPU is free to do other things. So, how do these timers work, and how can we utilize them? Well, luckily for you, in this video, I will show you how a timer like this might work, and how you can use one to run a function every few milliseconds. Let's get started. Much like the previous video, I made a PCB in order to visually show you how all these hardware timers work. In this case, the timer is based off the AppMega AA's 8-bit timer. Before I explain how it all works, I'll just show you it first. Here it is in timer mode with the slowest clock possible. Now here it is with the fastest possible clock. And finally, here it is in counter mode. Okay, now that you've seen it, let me explain it to you. Let's first begin by looking at the datasheet. The reason why I picked this specific timer is because of its simplicity. The other timers have other useful features, but I wanted to keep the demonstration simple. Don't worry though, because I will be covering the more advanced features later in this video. Anyways, we have the control register here, the counter here, some additional control circuitry here, a comparator here, and finally the clock input here. Let's begin with the counter. The counter simply counts up in binary and is labeled TCNT. Now, if you don't know binary, you can get a crash course online to learn how exactly it works. Don't worry though, it's really simple and be quick to learn. Anyways, the counter will count from zero all the way up to a maximum of 255. This is because the counter is only eight bits long. If it is full and tries to increment again, it will simply reset. This is because there is nowhere for the ninth bit to go. There's also similar behavior when the counter reaches its maximum value. The comparator checks when it is at the top, it then sends a signal back to the control circuitry. It is up to the programmer as to what happens afterwards, but it can generate an interrupt if so desired. We can see it in action on the example board too. Once the timer reaches the top, the TOV LED flashes. I accidentally got it backwards though, it should turn on when at the top, not off. Moving on, the TCCR register allows the programmer to select the desired control options. Due to the simplicity of this timer, the control circuitry only has a few options, and that is you can only change the clock's behavior, and that's it. But how does the clock's behavior change? Well, let's take a look. The clock has two sources, the CPU clock or an external pin. This is the reason why it is both called a counter and a timer. I have a simple 555 timer clock that will simulate our CPU clock. When TCCR is zero, the timer is paused and both clock sources are disconnected. When it is one, the clock is directly connected to the CPU clock. So one CPU clock means one timer tick. After that though, we get into the prescaler region. What is a prescaler? Well, it is a device that divides the CPU clock by a certain amount. If, for example, we use the first prescaler option of dividing by eight, that means it will take eight CPU clocks to clock the timer just once. The same can be said for the other options but with increasing division. You will also notice the other two settings at the bottom. They both have to do with another external clock source on the T0 pin. They both do the same thing but activate the clock on either the falling or rising edges. We can see it on the board when I set the TCCR register and then press the T0 button. One press equals one clock cycle. Okay, this is really cool to look at. But the actual AVRs have even more timers that have even more features. So with that, let's get out the actual AVRs and go over some practical use cases. Let's begin by replicating what we did on the board inside of the AVR. Let's also set up the overflow interrupt with the timer as well. So our CPU will do whatever it is currently busy with inside of the while loop. But once our timer overflows, the CPU will pause its main action and execute the interrupt. In this case, it is just toggling our LED. So by using this method, we can have timed events without using the entirety of the CPU's focus. Using this method, we've essentially just created a PWM output on our LED. 
While this output works, there is actually still a more efficient way to toggle an external pin. Let's take a look at timer 2 inside of the AVR. Timer 2 is very similar to timer 0, which is the timer that we just looked at. The difference is that it has an added functionality, which is a custom compare feature. This means that we can do something when the timer reaches a custom specified value. The first thing that comes to mind is to change the timer's resolution. Normally, the timer is in 8-bit mode, so it has to count to 255 and then it resets back to 0. When we put the timer into CTC mode, otherwise known as clear timer on compare match mode, we can define a new top for the timer. Instead of it being 255, we can instead set it to 98 for example. This essentially allows us to alter the frequency of the timer. Furthermore, we can actually set up a pin to automatically toggle when it reaches our custom top. Now for those of you who are thinking of use cases, we can use this functionality to set up a set output frequency on the OCN pin. One such use case is generating frequencies for music. If any of you have watched my first ever video, you could improve the code by using this method. Simply look up the frequency for the note you want to play, and then generate it automatically using timer 2. No CPU involvement whatsoever, aside from the initialization. It is also worth noting though, that this feature is not the greatest for PWM, since you are basically locked into a 50% duty cycle only. Speaking of PWM, let's take a look at the two PWM modes. Fast PWM and phase correct PWM. Let's first begin with fast PWM. In this mode, we will still use the compare feature, but it will act a little differently. The timer behaves mostly like it does when it is a normal mode, and then it resets once it reaches the maximum value. The difference now though, is that an external pin becomes high every time that the timer resets to the bottom, and low when it reaches the compare value. This essentially creates a variable duty cycle on the output pin. This is also how you can digitally dim an LED, and how you can have much more fine tuned control than you did if you did it with the CPU method. Now what about phase correct PWM mode makes it different from fast PWM? Well the main difference is that instead of counting just up, the timer alternates between counting up and then counting down. When the timer reaches the compare value, it does one of two things. If the timer is counting up, the pin will go low. And during down counting, it will instead go high. You may be asking why there is two different PWM methods and when to use each one. Well, for most applications, they are equivalent, and you should probably just use the fast PWM mode for simplicity and speed. But phase correct PWM can be useful if you want to make a measurement at the center of the PWM waveform, since the timer's behavior is symmetrical. Let's move on to the final timer. This timer is the largest and most feature-packed timer. First of all, this is a 16-bit timer, so you have a much higher resolution to work with. The only disadvantage to this timer, as compared to the others, is that it takes two read cycles to read the entire value of the timer. The timer also has two compare registers, meaning that you can run two different PWM duty cycles using the same timer. And finally, it has an input capture unit. The input capture unit is a very useful piece of hardware that allows you to capture the state of the timer based on an outside event, essentially giving you a stopwatch for external events. You could use this feature to calculate the frequency of a waveform, for example. But how does it work exactly? Well, when activated, it stores the value of the timer into separate registers for the CPU to read from. You have two methods of activating it. The first is by changing the logic level on the ICP1 pin. Using this, you can measure a square wave from a button press, for example. The other method is by using the analog comparator. When a level change occurs in the comparator, it will send a signal to the capture unit. I used a method similar to this in my capacitor measurement video. Well, that's basically it for microcontroller timers. So in summary, you can use them to time events without using valuable CPU time. You can also use them to generate specific frequencies or specific duty cycles on external pins without CPU interference. Hopefully you can start integrating them into your microcontroller code to make your code more efficient. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing so that you can see the other videos that I make. Have a good one.